Hi everyone, it's Nikki here. Uh, for those who are new to my channel, my name is Nikki J Marcus. I am a freelance editor and author. And here on my channel you'll find books about writing books. <laughs> um, pretty much everything really. I post top 10 videos, um, talk about fav my favourite films and things like that. So this is my monthly end of the month vlog in which I just do a bit of a wrap up about the books that I've been reading for the past few weeks. So um, it's been a bit of a bumper month again. Um, I've gotten through 18, um, so I'll probably break this video into little um, talk about six, pause for a second and talk about six more because otherwise my camera gets really funny with me sometimes and just decides to stop filming and I realise that it's cut out halfway through and I have to film the whole thing again. So we'll do it in little stages and hopefully it'll play nice. So, um, moving swiftly into the first book, um, I read Phoenix Fire by S.D. Grimm. I actually finished this one right at the end of January, but it was just after I'd filmed the last, um, sorry, February, so it was just after I'd filmed the last vlog, so it didn't quite make it in, but um, this is a YA fantasy story that uh, revolves around the idea that there are people who are phoenixes, um, and they they die but then they'll come back to life again um, in, a, as a, in a new body um, and there'll be a baby, they'll grow up and um, they have the power to fight the sort of demons and darker creatures and there are good phoenixes and dark phoenixes as well. Um, I gave this a three and a half star rating. I loved the concept, um, however I felt there was a lot of info constantly being thrown at you. Um, as well as changing POVs between the past and present, which, while you could keep up with them, um, it did take a bit of concentration at times, because it was back and forth a lot, and I just kind of felt it was a little bit too much. This is going to be the first book in a series, and I, I would have liked it if some of the information had been spaced out a little bit more, so that you just weren't constantly, by the time you sort of got your head around one bit of info, suddenly you were finding out something else new, and. Um, there wasn't much time to really get to know the characters or the plot as it was immediately happening. We were so concerned with going back and forth of things that have already happened and what might be happening in the future and I just sometimes felt there wasn't quite enough concentration on the present. Um, but it was still enjoyable and it was something a little bit different so if you're looking for a, a YA fantasy story with a bit of a twist then it's probably worth checking out. The next one I read was Mad Blood Stirring by Simon Mayo. Um, this is a four and a half star read for me. Uh, I should say both of these came from NetGalley so far. Um, and this one is a historical fiction piece. And it's set in a prison camp uh, at the end of the uh, war, um, the 1812. Um, so we're talking early 19th century. So prisoners from, from those wars. Um, it's a very slow start. It took me a little while to get into it, but once I did, I actually found it a really compelling tale. Uh, it's told from the point of view of um, several of the prisoners and also the um, the wife of the sort of governor of the prison as well. Uh, two of the inmates have a sort of MM romance that grows up between them as well, which um, I thought was handled really well, and I, I liked how they did that. Uh, it's one of those books I don't want to kind of give everything away. <laughs> it's always the trouble when you're doing reviews. Well, you're speaking because you have to think uh, what can't I say that's going to ruin it. But it's a fairly gritty story. Um, if that's your sort of thing and you, you want a historical fiction that's gritty realism, a bit of LGBT thrown in, then it's definitely worth having a look at. <coughs> Another net galley read next was The Art of Creative Watercolour by Daniel Donaldson. Um, I grabbed this one because I'm always keen to try new creative things and I was owing and eyeing about doing some painting again. What I loved about this book, um, I gave it a four star rating, was um, the fact that it kind of covers all aspects. It was a great guide in terms of introducing different ideas about technique, what sort of brushes, but there was also a really creative aspect as well. It wasn't concentrating on helping you create fine art and saying everyone's got to create these perfect images. There was an idea that it was just about enjoying yourself and being creative. And so Donaldson gave you several ways to go about that, creating swatches, um, creating uh, sort of journals in which you use uh, different 
ideas for your inspiration, bits of material you found that you love the colour and um, it, so it was a really nice overall introduction to the idea of painting without being too preachy about you know you have to do it this particular way, this is how you paint. Uh, it was very open to just letting your creative juices flow I guess is the way to say it. So I mean, a very very useful book if you're into art but you've always been put off by the sort of slightly snobbish attitude towards it. The next one I read was a book that I received um, free via Kobo when they've had their list of books available for free uh, listed by the authors. As such it's um, a self-published book. It's called A Touch of Midnight um, by Lara Adrian um, and it's from her Midnight Breed series. Now this is a sort of paranormal slash sci-fi in a way because the breed are they're sort of vampires but kind of not they're more like they come from another world um, I gave it 3.5 stars it's enjoyable but it is pretty predictable you kind of know where the story is going even before it starts there's the typical romance of you know oh, he's found his suitable mate just well by chance and there's a villain and the villains after the mate and they're after an artifact and they, together they foil them, loads of sex, that sort of thing. So it was enjoyable but there was nothing really new particularly here. The next one I read was Tested in Fire by E.J. Russell and this is from her Art Medium series. Um, I gave it four stars. Now when I requested this book from NetGalley it wasn't clear um, in the blurb or on the cover or anything that this was the second book in the series and I did feel that I'd kind of missed something in not having read book one. You could still follow the story fine, and I enjoyed the characters, uh, I liked the plot idea of these sort of cursed masks that can allow people to jump between bodies, but there was so much um, referencing things that had happened to the two characters previously, which I assume took place in book one, that I kind of felt I lost a little bit of an understanding of their relationship and where they were both coming from at the start of the story, because I hadn't read that earlier book. So if you're going to read it, I would recommend reading book one first. The next one I read was a book I received for free from the publisher as a review copy uh, in print, in paperback. And it is The Shape of Water by Daniel Krauss and Guillermo del Toro. Now for those who don't know, um, the book and film go hand in hand. It's not that this is just a novelisation of the film. They were written with the intention that they go together. Um, they were developed at the same time. So obviously it is the, the story of the film, however I gave this five stars, what I loved about it was the fact that there's a lot more detail on different characters. The film is very much um, Elisa's story, but the book really gives you some great insight into people like Strickland. Strickland comes across as a very typical bad guy in the film, but in the book we get to see a lot more of his um, motivation, what's happened to him that's led him to the point where he is the way he is and I really enjoyed that, I thought it added a nice new dimension to the film particularly in terms of understanding the minor characters. So next up we have a book that my mother bought me as a gift, uh, Swedish Essentials of Grammar, thrilling I know. Um, four and a half stars for me, um, obviously it's not one I've sat and read cover to cover but I've been looking through it, um, it's really nicely organised, it's a great basic start guide. Um, it is fairly simple in some ways, it only covers the main points, um, as the title suggests, it's essentials, not a no, full grammar, but for people like me starting out in the language, uh, it's a really nice, uh, easy reference work that is going to help me, just quick reference for verb tables, adjective endings um, and other grammar notes. So. Um, Really nicely presented and definitely worth it if you're a language student interested in Swedish. The next one is coming back to NetGalley again. and um, This was Amazing Origami Boxes by Tomoko Fuse, which hopefully I pronounced correctly. Um, a full star read for me. Uh, I found it really fascinating. Um, I've gotten into paper craft a little bit recently and I decided to have a look at this book. The boxes are absolutely beautiful. Uh, the only thing I found though was that it probably does suppose that you have done some origami before. It has step by step instructions of how to create all these boxes, but honestly with all the arrows and folds and things, looking at the instructions sometimes I was a little bit confused. 
and probably if you're used to following similar instructions, um, similar diagrams, you wouldn't have trouble with it. But for me, I think it would probably be a bit trial and error for a few goes until I worked out exactly what they were asking me to do. Um, just because there were so many arrows going here, there and everywhere and you're like, oh, so am I folding that? Is it is a turn? Is it this? Um, it sort of mentioned that they were different difficulty levels, but I would say all of them are probably medium upwards as opposed to beginner ones. So uh, an interesting book to check out, but probably if, if you're someone who's already got a bit of a basis in the art of origami to begin with. Next up is another net gallery read, The Territory of Light by Yuko uh, Tsushima. I keep getting all these names that I'm not good at pronouncing. Um, I, should, I ought to learn a bit more about Japanese pronunciation, sorry, but Yuko Tsushima I think is right. Um, I've read a book by this author last month and really enjoyed it, so when I saw another one listed I, I couldn't help but request it and it is um, a five-star read for me. It's a really beautiful story. Essentially it's a, a mother um, who's got a, a young child and has separated from her husband and she moves into this flat and it's kind of her experiences as she deals with her new status and her new way of life. It's not a linear story in some ways, I mean it does progress in a linear time period but it's more all these little vignettes of we see we glimpse different days in her life and different things happening. There's not really a big main plot point other than what I've already said that it's this woman who's getting used to life on her own. But it's very beautiful, um, very lyrical piece. Uh, next up, another net gallery read was *The Hawkman* by Jane Roseberg Laforge. This is a four-star read for me. I would call it magical realism. I guess it's set um, just post the Great War, uh, World War One, and it's really beautiful prose. I loved the idea. It's a retelling, in some ways, of a fairy tale. Um, though fairly loosely. I loved the interaction between our two main characters, the Hawkman um, and the, the woman who sort of sees a different side of him to everyone else in the town and tries to help him. The only thing I thought was that at times it lacked cohesion. I loved all the characters individually, I did like their, react, their interactions, but some of the characters felt a bit separate from the story. You've got these two main people and their, their um, narratives worked well together. But you had these other characters, some of whom I found quite interesting, but they were kind of always just left on the sidelines a little bit. So I might have liked to just have seen them brought in together a little bit more. But it's still a um, really fascinating piece, very beautifully written. And if you're into magical realism and retellings, then you'd probably want to check this one out. Next up, The Man Who Laughed by Victor Hugo. Um, if you've been watching my vlogs, you'll have heard me talking since the beginning of the year about the fact I went and saw the Grinning Man musical which is based on this book and how I've since been going through trying to watch all the old film versions of the story and now finally I've made it to the book itself in a way. I say that because I got this from Project Gutenberg uh, it's an uncredited translator and um, it's just impossible to find a, a good English translation of this text there isn't one available uh, from Penguin, Oxford Classics, anything like that at the moment so there's only these older um, public domain translations. I felt that the translation was a little bit clunky. There were odd bits where I thought it didn't really read like Victor Hugo and I think that is probably the translation. That said, um, I still enjoyed it. Um, it was really fascinating to see. Um, I kind of noticed it from the films that I've been watching as well, but particularly from the book to notice the way they changed the story from the musical. And I can see why they changed bits and it does definitely work but it's nice to go back to the original. What I would like to do eventually is get myself um, a um, French copy and read it in the original language. So I've got that on my book depository wish list and that will happen at some point. I've got the cash for it. Uh, it's obviously pretty typical Hugo Fair. I'd say, you know, there's a lot of commentary on social injustice and the like. Um, it's probably not his most accessible book though. If you haven't read Victor Hugo and you're coming to him for the first time, I would probably recommend Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, as a, as a first one rather than this. But if you're familiar with his work already then, um, and you haven't come across it, then it is worth reading. Um, I do love uh, the character of Gwynplaine. I think he's absolutely amazing and uh, I'm quite in love with him, honestly. <laughs> 
so then we had Angel's Feather by my friend Alina Popescu. Now this is a sci-fi MM work and it's based around the idea that the, there are these angel-like uh, creatures, they're not actually angels in the biblical sense, they're actually um, alien creatures who have come to Earth and there's a kind of dystopian society around Earth at the moment. The people of Earth are not allowed to leave the planet and the uh, angels are, oh, they're called flyers in, in this series, are patrolling it in a way, making sure no one's building spaceships and things like that. But one of the humans, Adam, falls in love with one of the flyers, um, which is where the story kind of kicks off and the flyer falls in love with him as well. So. I really loved the concept, uh, I thought it was a brilliant twist on the idea of the angel-human romances that we see around. Um, occasionally I kind of wished there was a little bit more background information on the flyers, however this is the first book in a series and I do know that the next series we're kind of taking the characters out into, or the next book sorry in the series are taking the characters out into space a bit. So I imagine that um, Alina will be bringing in a bit more of the flyer lore and the background as these books continue. It was a four star read for me in any case. Uh, so yes, um, really great, something a little bit different. So if you're looking for an MM tale with a twist, um, then this is one you might want to have a look at. And we're coming into the home stretch now, six books to go. Now the next two are actually audiobooks. Now I am not a big audiobook listener, um, partly because I don't really find I have time for it. Um, I listen to music when I'm walking, but I don't really have time to sit and listen to audiobooks a lot, so it's not something I've ever really got into. Plus I am quite visual um, in general, I'm a fairly visual person, and I, I do prefer to read the words on the page as opposed to listening to them. But these two I listened to recently while I was doing some drawing, so if I am going to listen in the future that is probably a good time to do it. Usually I listen to music when I'm drawing, but I did find that it was fine listening to the audiobook as well while I was working. Now. The two I read, I, or listened to, um, I did so for a particular reason, and both are narrated by Chris Barry. Uh, if you've been watching some other videos, you'll know that I'm in a bit of a Chris Barry mood at the moment, uh, and I've been re-watching all of Red Dwarf and The British Empire. So first of all, we have Sharing the Dream audiobook, which is written by Jonathan Rice, narrated by Chris Barry as Gordon Brittus. Um, this is the British Empire um, audiobook they released. There was a, a physical um, paperback book that went with it as well. And it's basically Gordon Britus as if he's telling us, you know, his, um, his dream, his vision for the leisure industry and how it's going to bring about world peace and that. And in the course of this, he refers to a lot of the incidents that have happened uh, during, I think, really the first four seasons um, of the show out of seven. Um, so if you're a fan of the show, it's brilliant, it reminds you of some great moments that you enjoyed in different episodes. It's probably not one you'd listen to if you don't know the show, because it really wouldn't mean anything to you at all. But as a fan of the show, it's great fun, four stars for me. And then we moved on to Infinity Welcome's Careful Drivers. Now this is the first of four novels um, connected to Red Dwarf that were written by Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, the show's creator. This one is narrated by Chris Barry. Now Chris Barry obviously played Rimmer in the show and he started life, for those of you who don't know, as an impressionist before he went into acting. So he is obviously absolutely brilliant at doing all the different voices. I mean he can take off his fellow cast members brilliantly um, as well as doing all the voices for other characters as they crop up in the novel. It's really a joy, he's a great narrator, um, he, he has a wonderful, easy listening, listening sort of voice and as I've said his, his different dialogue um, accents are amazing. So really great fun to listen to. Um, this covers bits and pieces, there's a lot of extra stuff that we don't see from the show, um, but then there's also bits that come directly from different episodes. So again, it's great for fans of the show, but this one Probably you could listen to as well, if, even if you haven't watched the TV show, and you'd still find it funny and amusing. But obviously there's that added um, level if you do know the characters already. Moving along, I read Getting Wild by Jen Stark, which is the first in her Immortal Vegas um, urban fantasy series. Now, um, Wild is our 
heroine. She is sort of a little bit psychic. She can use tarot cards to help her find things. So she works as a bit of a thief, really, finding magical artifacts for different people. Now, I had a few problems with this book. I gave it, um, did I say I gave Infinity Welcome to Careful Drivers five stars? If not, I did. Um, anyway, getting wild, three and a half stars. There were things I liked about the concept, however, for me there just wasn't enough world building. We were introduced to various institutions uh, and groups such as the Arcana Council, but we never really understand who they are, where they've come from, what their role is. Are they the good guys, the bad guys? We think they're probably more the good guys, but they claim they're neutral. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I had so many questions about that just weren't answered, and perhaps they are answered later in the series, but I did feel that they needed something a little bit more in this first book. Um, just to help improve the world building. The other issue I had with it was that all the male characters in this story uh, want to get our heroine into bed, but they all do it rather aggressively. There's a lot of um, mental manipulation, physical manipulation going on where they're all trying to have sex with her, and I just found that a little bit too creepy at times. You know, maybe one character doing it, you'd say, oh, that's his personality, but every single male character was doing this. and. So I, if I were her, I'd just be like telling them all where to get stuffed, you know. And I just thought it was a bit too much. Um, there was a bit too much of a sort of rapey culture about all the, men, all the men in the story. Moving along, um, I should say Getting Wild I got from Kobo as a, one of their free ebooks. Moving along, this book is one that my mother sent me. She read it and liked it. Uh, it's called Into the Water by Paula, Paula Hawkins. Now, this is not the sort of book I would necessarily go and pick up myself. It's a psychological thriller slash mystery. Uh, and Paula Hawkins wrote The Girl on the Train, which I have neither read nor seen. So I had no expectation coming into this book. However, on the whole, I found it pretty interesting and enjoyable. I gave it four stars. Uh, basically, it's a small town. Um, there's an area of water that's known as the Drowning Pond locally. And a lot of women over time have drowned here, um, either been drowned as witches, have committed suicide, um, or as we sort of discover through the stories, have ended, had their lives end there by more nefarious reasons. Uh, and I enjoyed the multiple narrations and the way they gradually revealed different aspects of the story and the background of different characters, all seen from each other's point of view. It was really intriguing, it worked well, it kept you guessing, kept you turning the page. The only thing I thought was a little bit negative, which is why it got four stars, not five, is the ending felt a little bit rushed. They had this really slow build up, gradually getting all this information, but then there was a suddenly a lot revealed all in the last few chapters. And I just would have liked to have seen the pacing maintained a little bit more. But um, if you're into these kind of... Um, mystery thrillers with a bit of a psychological twist, then you probably will really enjoy this. Next up was Absinthe, um, The Exquisite Elixir by Whittles and Bro. Uh, this is a non-fiction book from NetGalley, a five-star read for me. Uh, basically, it tells us the history of Absinthe, um, its production, its history in culture, um, emphasis in France and the US in particular. Um, why and how it fell out of favour and how it's now made a bit of a comeback. Uh, it then goes on to give you some recipes using absinthe and uh, notes some, um, some brands to, to try out that are reputable uh, brands. Absinthe has always held an interest for me because of the bohemian uh, literary connotations of the drink. I first tried some in the Czech Republic back probably about 15 years ago, although now from reading this book it looks like what I tried was probably uh, not one of the pure traditionally produced absinths, which does make me really interested to go and try it in a more traditional manner um, and to have it served in a more traditional manner as well in the future. So um, that's something for my bucket list I guess. Uh, I, I was looking the other day online but they're all quite expensive to buy here so it won't be something I'm doing immediately. But I loved the book, it was beautifully presented. Uh, there was plenty of um, images, um, some of the advertising from the past, and um, all in all, if you're interested in absinthe, um, it's definitely a book to buy if you're interested in uh, the history of different drinks, um, social history aspects of alcohol as well, or if, like me, you're just a bit of an aficionado because of the uh, literary connotations of people like Oscar Wilde and everyone sitting back in Paris and 
sipping their absinthe. So um, one to check out anyway, I really enjoyed it. And the last book for this month was um, Wolves by C. Gockel, which is the first book in the I Bring the Fire series. This is a series that I first heard about probably about three years ago, maybe pushing four. And I only just got around to reading it. Again, it's one I found f listed for free on Kobo. It's actually part of a bundle on Kobo, so you get books one to three. So at the moment I'm just reviewing book one, but next month I will continue and read books two and three as well and give you the lowdown on those. This is a story based on Norse mythology with Loki as a protagonist and Amy who is a human um, who stumbles into his path, or he stumbles into her path we should say. Uh, there were lots of things I liked about this book, I gave it four stars. Um, there's a lot of great humour, I liked Loki's personality and uh, I particularly enjoyed his interactions with modern technology, like the way he thinks that the car is pulling the windows up and down itself so every time he wants an in a window down he goes car open the window and doesn't realise that Amy is the one doing it. Uh, so there are lots of humorous moments. There were things I liked about the story, um, I like the way Loki is shown as the hero of the piece. The only th troubles I had were, I did wonder at times, it's, it's very Marvel Loki based in some ways. Um, you know, he's a frost giant, Odin found him on a battlefield, took him to Asgard. Um, it's not an exact replication of Marvel Loki, but there were enough similar points that it kind of gnawed at me a little bit. And I think that's more from a writer's point of view that I was thinking, mm, can she use this much stuff that's clearly coming from Marvel rather than myth? But um, I think she's probably just on the right line of it not being a problem. But um, it was a sort of blend of comic book Marvel, Norse mythology and Norse mythology as in the original myths. So, but it's still really enjoyable. Um, Loki is a nice enjoyable character who you have fun reading in this and I was, by the end of the book I was interested and wanted to read on so I will be picking up, I wanted a quick break so I've been reading a bit of um, urban fantasy paranormal in the last week or so so I wanted a break to read some non-fiction but I will be going back to it. The only other issue to know about the book that I had, and it may just be um, the version uploaded on Kobo, but there are some major formatting problems with this book. Every time there is a scene break, any of the text above the screen break on that page is lost. So you kind of lose the end of the scene before every time there's a scene break. Sometimes it, it is only one or two sentences and you pretty much know how the scene ends, but sometimes it's the bulk of the page and you're in the middle of a scene and you never get to find out how that scene concludes because you've just got this big empty space and then the scene break and then the new scene starts. So I mean that was something I know it was a free book so um, it's different than if I paid for it in a way but at the same time if I were the author I'd want to put out a product that's correct. So I don't know if that was just an issue with my copy or whether it's across the board but it's just something to bear in mind if you are getting a copy. So I think that does bring us to the end of the month. Um, some of the books I read in this were part of the AuthorTube Readathon hosted by Alina Popescu, uh, for which you'll find my wrap-up video um, here on my channel. Um, so it was great to do that, a, a little bit of a push to get the four books read in the week, but we managed it, so all good. I've still got 16 to 18 books in my TBR pile, a mix of print and ebook, so plenty to keep me going through the next month, and I'll be back at the end of April with more Nikki's new reads. Bye for now, everyone.